Hello everyone! Howdy! Let's recap week number three, shall we? We had talked about a single particle and then introduced systems of particles and we discussed how both of those move. So let's very quickly recap what we discussed. First, we started with a single particle of mass m, you know, moving through space. And of course it had a certain velocity, position, and acceleration. And most importantly, we had to discuss the kinetics of the system, of the velocity here. The kinetics of the system was described as follows. We had linear momentum balance. And linear momentum balance told us that the sum of all forces applied to that particle, right, there are certain forces applied to this particle, then the sum of all forces was nothing else but the time derivative of linear momentum and for a particle of constant mass, which is what we're assuming all along, this was simply mass times the acceleration of the particle. The next thing we discussed was angular momentum balance, which told us that the net torque applied to a particle with respect to some point B, right? so if I fix a given reference point B up here, then there can be a certain torque being applied by the forces with respect to that point. Oops, and this is MB. Sorry, can't see this again. And this is nothing else but the vector from B to the particle times the linear momentum of the particle plus the rate of change of the angular momentum HB, HB dot. And as we discussed, we should always try to get this to zero, right? This is zero if either B is fixed. So if B is fixed or moving parallel to the particle. And that's what we should always aim for. And then we had seen that the special case of 2D motion reduces to something simple, namely into D, the net torque applied in the plane equals the mass moment of inertia IB times the angular acceleration, assuming that the particle remains at a fixed distance from the point of rotation. So for example, if we have a particle on a stick, right, something like this, if this here is a fixed distance R, then we had seen that the mass moment of inertia was nothing else but mass times R squared. Okay, and then the last, the, the third principle we had was the work energy balance. So, work energy. And this told us that we can bypass these two, which link forces to accelerations, or torques to angular accelerations, by simply requiring that the kinetic energy at a future time, 2, minus the kinetic energy at some earlier time, t1, equals what? And here we saw that this was nothing else but the total work done onto the particle, which we could further subdivide into conservative forces and non-conservative forces, and we'd seen how the conservative forces derive from a potential. That's almost all we had. One special case we discussed at the very end was the impact of a single particle onto a wall. That's a particular case. It's in fact an example, but it also required us to discuss some theory. So if the particle is hitting the wall, and let's say it's coming in with some velocity, which we call it velocity at time t minus before hitting the wall. And then after impact, you know, it goes off again. And so after impact, it has another velocity. This one we call it v at time t plus. And we assume that the wall is frictionless. It's a smooth wall, so mu here is zero. That's what we usually assume for our impact problems. And in this case, we had seen two simple relations. Because there can be no force acting tangential to the wall, we had seen that the tangential component of the velocity after impact is the same as the tangential component before impact. Right? And the second relation we had seen was that the normal velocity changes. This one must change because we're already changing directions, right? We're coming in and then we're leaving again. So there at least must be a flip in sign over here from the earlier to the later time. And if these two velocities are the same, that depends on the type of impact that we're having. And usually any such impact here is characterized by a coefficient of restitution, which we called E. This E was a number between zero and one, and it indicated how elastic or plastic the impact was. And this E was nothing else but the factor that came in here. 
So if E is 1, you're going off with the same speed as you came in. If E is 0, you're not leaving the wall at all. And any E between 0 and 1 gives you some partial rebound. And that's essentially everything we discussed for a single particle. Now, what we then discussed is how we can use all that and transfer it to a system of particles. So let's go over here and let's discuss how this generalizes. And what we discussed in particular is, let's assume that we now have not a single particle, but we have a whole zoo of particles over here. Let me just draw four of them. They may have different masses, different sizes and so forth, and they're connected. And they're connected, for example, by rigid links or elastic springs, right? And all of these are possible connections. They can also not be connected at all, for example, or all kinds of crazy connections in between. And in these cases, of course, there are also forces acting on the system, right? So here can be a force, there can be another force, let's call this F1, F2, and all these forces are acting on the system, F3. And now the question is what happens with that system over here? The first thing we saw is that we can treat this whole system more or less as a superparticle. And we take all the masses and we concentrate them in the center of mass. In the center of mass, you know, one can calculate from the usual equations, let's say it ends up somewhere over here. If this is my center of mass, then we can think of this as essentially being a superparticle, which has the total mass, which we call capital M. And there's nothing else but the sum of all the masses of the individual particles, and it is located at the center of mass. What we do is we replace the system of particles by that, essentially. And this allowed us to formulate all of these equations for a system of particles. First of all, well, LMB is almost identical. So what we had seen here is that, again, the sum of all forces acting onto the system equals what? It's the mass, which is now the total mass, times the acceleration, which is, now, which is now the acceleration of the center of mass. We also showed that when we calculate all these forces, we actually only have to consider external forces like these ones acting onto the system from the outside. There are also inner forces in the rigid links, in the springs, but we don't need to consider them here because they cancel pairwise. Then we went to the angular momentum balance, which was also very analogous here, we simply showed, I'm a bit too high, that the net torque onto the system, and again, we only have to consider the external torques because all internal forces vanish again when summing them up, was nothing else but, well, velocity of, ooh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake over here. You're not saying anything, <laughs> you can't. This should have been the velocity of point V. My sincere apologies. I don't know why I did this wrong. This is the velocity of point B cross P. That's embarrassing. Plus HB dot. And this looks exactly the same as before. Pretty much is exactly the same as before, except this P is now the near momentum of the anterior system. So the total mass times the velocity of the center of mass. This is still the velocity of some reference point B that we choose up here with respect to which we look at the system. And this is now the angular momentum of the whole system. And again, if we do the analogy in 2D, right, if all my particles, like here, are at a fixed distance, so if here, for example, you're rotating about a certain point, and all your particles are stuck to a disk, so one particle is here, one particle is here, one particle is here, and this whole thing is rotating, you know, with some phi dot or phi double dot as the acceleration, and all of these have different fixed radii, then we can again write this thing as mb equals ib times phi double dot, which is now the angular acceleration of the system, and in this particular case the ib is nothing else but the sum of all the particles, their masses, and their distances, so here called them capital R, to the center. And so these are really analogous. What's even better and more analogous is the work energy balance. I don't really need to change anything here because I can more or less copy what we have over there. Namely, the kinetic energy at time t2 minus the kinetic energy at time t1 equals the work done on the system in going from state 1 to 2.
The kinetic energy is now the kinetic energy of all the particles. All we have to do is sum it up. The work done is the work done by all the forces in the system. And here we have to be a tiny bit careful because these are not just the external forces. So this is really the total work done on the system. Here we need to consider also internal springs and these will of course have a potential energy which we cannot neglect in general. And so if we look at this, what just this, this shows us is that single particle and systems of particle are really behaving by the same rules. Linear momentum balance means F equals ma. Angular momentum balance, very simply put, means torque equals IB times angular acceleration. Of course, in 3D, this will become a lot more complicated, but for the simple 2D cases here, these two are very analogous, and of course, they're analogous for a single particle and a system of particles. And work energy balance is really the same in both cases. We just need to be careful that the trick of taking external forces and torques only does not apply for the work down here. Uh, we haven't discussed the impact analog, which is two particles colliding, but this is what we'll do next week. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is this analogy can really help us understand what happens for systems of particles if we think about them as a superparticle. So we take this whole system and we essentially replace it by a superparticle moving through space. Especially if the links are rigid, so we don't have to discuss external or internal work done here, the difference is the same then. Um, in that particular case, um, it really is nothing else but a superparticle moving with a velocity, which is the velocity of the center of mass. It has a position, which is the position of the center of mass. Oops, and this up here is the velocity of the center of mass again. Sorry, if I write too high, you cannot see that. Um, and the principles which apply then are pretty much the same as for a single particle. And that's all for this week. Hope to see you again soon. Ciao.